America has a long tradition of small religious groups creating communities separate from the daily grind, and most of them are peaceful. But even a peaceful group that goes its own way can sometimes come into harsh, unpredictable conflict with the modern world. For the past six months, Bill Lagatuta has been looking at one group's version of splendid isolation. My first impression was, here's utopia. Here are all these families, they're happy, here are all these kids playing together, it's in the country. I was very happy. I remember just going for walks with our group, with a teacher, and always having somebody to be with, and knowing everybody. It blew me away. I really thought that it was uh, the most fantastic thing that I'd ever seen. And it's a genuine reflection of the simple way that they live, without private property, without money. To find the tranquility of the Bruderhof, which means a place of brothers, you don't have to look that far. Just an hour and a half from the bustle of New York City is one of the world's oldest surviving communes. We want to do God's work. This Christian enclave, exported from Germany 77 years ago, is the place Sybil Sender discovered back in 1958. People often ask, where do you people live? And we live in these buildings. We try to keep our standard of living low, which means that we share as much as possible. But Sybil didn't come by choice. I was building up inner venom the entire trip. Her husband practically dragged her in, kicking and screaming. Finally, I said, all right, to get this over with, I will go to the Bruderhof. I will hate it. They will hate me. And that will be the end of this argument. OK? OK. So I put on my fire engine red tube knit dress. I wanted to come across as something these prudes would really reject. Now, 40 years into the life. Simple, modest, and we think it makes a statement. Sybil has a somewhat different sense of fashion. We do not want to focus attention on ourselves as physical beings, but as people who are ready to serve. And the best way to serve... The cohesiveness of family life has been destroyed. According to commune leader Christoph Arnold... We need to rediscover the family. ...is to live, as the Bruderhof say, in community. Christoph, like his father and grandfather before him, presides over all the Bruderhof members scattered in communes across the U.S. and England. Current total membership, 2,400. Our songs, our art, our activities are very often in the sense of a prayer to God. When people come up here and they say, where is your church? And I have to say, we have none. It, the church is everything we're doing. Because of the way they dress, because of their communal lifestyle, the Bruderhof may seem like they're living in another century, like their cousins the Amish. But there are a few surprises here. For one thing, the brothers and sisters of the Bruderhof don't run from technology. As a matter of fact, they embrace it. Good morning, Riften Community Playthings. This is Bonnie. Which means the Bruderhof are hooked up online. We're having a bit of a problem with stock, and it should probably come within the next week. There are just so many people in line for these E87s. All from community playthings. And for a small religious community. Looks okay, got the knobs. The Bruderhof is quite a big business. With factories that churn out daycare furniture and equipment for the disabled. We have a little overhead in the sense that we don't have a paid payroll. The Bruderhof grossed $25 million last year. I think I'm the lowest paid CEO in the country. My, my salary is zero. John Rhodes <laughs> considers himself just another brother. My joy is great because this is a wonderful place to be and a wonderful place to work. As for the workers... My mother Einstein is going. Let me check that out. They get exactly as much as the CEO. Every afternoon we come down here and work. Nothing. And she, she feels mostly, but she knows it very well. But you'd never know it from watching them work. Here we say, you work till you can only wiggle the small finger. 
No work is the devil's workshop. The Bruderhof's latest venture, this is what kind of plane? Is a charter airline service for luxury clients. This is a Gulfstream 3, in a, built in 1984. This chair here is the CEO's chair. The controls for the whole aircraft, for all the lighting and the, and the videos and the sound system is all from that chair. There's a phone. Uh, that's the chair you want to reserve on this, yeah. on this flight. Huh? And riding in it, well, let's just say you can get pretty close to heaven. It's the, the best way you can travel. Joe Kiderling, one of the brothers. Yeah, we got two separate phones and a separate line for the fax. Yeah, this is the way to go. Celebrities rent this thing? Yeah. Sharon Stone, Van Halen. Van Halen's flown this a, plane. Yeah, they've flown, flown the plane. Yeah. Do you find anything at all unusual about the fact that you're in this business, but at the same time you're a religious community dedicated to living a life of poverty, a life of really I, having nothing? Personally, I, I find it uh, thrilling. It sounds like the best of both worlds. This is some technology we're exploring. High technology, old-fashioned values. But is this too good to be true? From the first look, it's so appealing and so wonderful. But there's a lot more to this group than meets the eye. All the necessities in their life are, are provided for. Professor and author Julius Rubin. The trade-off is that at any time, they can, be, they can be placed in a crisis. They can be told that enemies are threatening and that we must mobilize. It sounds like you're describing an atmosphere of fear. Oh, yeah. You live in, well, I personally lived in constant fear. When we come back, meet a teenager who ran away after she broke one of the Bruderhof's cardinal rules. What happened to you? Well, I got caught kissing a boy. just very desperate to get out of there. Susanna Zumpe was born into the Bruderhof. Yes, Everhart Arnold is my great-grandfather, and he's the person who founded the whole thing. But for her, life in the community was no paradise. She spent 40 years. For me, the commune was hell. <laughs> now that I'm out, I feel so free. It was the best thing I ever did. Leaving the commune was the best thing I ever did. She fled in the middle of the night. Because I just left a little note on the bed saying I made my choice. When she was only 15 years old. I didn't want anyone to guess that I was going to leave, that I was leaving that night. And I walked for a couple of miles and it was pouring with rain. It was an awful storm. I've never been so scared in my life. Today, at age 18, Susanna is busy rebuilding her life far away from the Bruderhof. But I learned that the world isn't all bad the way they made it out to be. And she has not spoken to her parents in more than a year. Parents, if I call there, they don't take my calls. They don't answer my letters. Why was she so afraid? And what did she do to get on the wrong side of the Bruderhof? What happened to you? Well, I got caught kissing a boy. It you were how old? 14. It was very harmless. Harmless? Not to the Bruderhof, who have strict rules about boys and girls. Oh, what did they say to you? Oh, they told me that I was a whore and that if I didn't stop it, I would go to hell. <laughs> For kissing a boy? Yeah. And that I was playing with fire and, yeah, a whore. It, it sounds like you're describing an atmosphere of fear. Oh, yeah. You live in, well, I personally lived in constant fear. I was in constant fear of being caught for this or that. And I was always getting in trouble for the way I walked, for the way I talked, for, for everything. I think what Susie said is true. Professor Julius Rubin interviewed Susanna what for his mean? book on the Bruderhof. What they said to her was, because of her listening to popular music and folk music, because she shaved her legs, that they said that she would come to no good. For that behavior, she was made an outcast. I was not allowed to talk to anyone or contact, make contact with anybody. Um, except for my parents. I wasn't allowed to talk to any of the other young people. They're so concerned with their little rules and their little this and this and that that they forget the main message Jesus had, which was to love. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before she ran away, Susanna, taking her sister's advice, agreed to talk to Bruderhof leader Christoph Arnold. I did not want to talk to him. It was the last thing I felt like doing. She says you told her if she left, she'd end up as a prostitute and die of AIDS. That's, uh, that's what she says, yeah. Did you say that then? Christoph hesitated, but his wife, Verena, remembers okay. Susanna well. Yeah. 
Oh. It was a warning. Oh. Out of love to her. She was a very flirty girl. Very she flirty? Come under light. <laughs> very flirty. I know Susie is a very unhappy girl. Yes. And we tried to help her. We didn't succeed. You don't always no. succeed, but we've tried. And it wasn't only Christoph who chastised Susanna. She was a terrible flirt, and we were scared for her. So Susanna's well. parents, Ben and Mariana Zumpi, agreed to tell us their side of the story. She says she got in tremendous trouble for, for kissing a boy. Yes, because we feel, we strongly believe in a life of purity. We take a very firm stand. No sexuality or anything like that between boys and girls before they're married. No, no kissing? No. Hand-holding? No. Hugging? No. no. Absolutely no, because you're playing with fire. One leads to the other. If you, start, so much if, you, if you start kissing and hand-holding it, where will it stop? We are too weak for it. With the harsh words of her elders ringing in her ears. Because I didn't know what I would do if they somehow realized I was gone. Susanna carried out her escape plan. What are they going to do, come chasing after me, and then what, you know? In fact, Susanna's parents did so try to talk her into over. returning. I pleaded with her to come back with us. But she refused. The only way that I could get back with my parents is to go back and join. And I'm never going to do that. Ever. Well, she says that she was, she was made an outcast. That absolutely not. That is absolutely not true. Susie was totally forgiven. Are they shunned? Well, we have church discipline. Are you cut off from other members of the commune? Yes, for a few days. Families are shattered all the time because of exclusion and, ch and church discipline. And children are traumatized by this process in the same way that they might be traumatized by divorce. What exactly is church discipline? Because it sounds an awful lot like shunning a person. Yes, the first type of discipline is simply where people will, simply, will not talk to you. It's some of the worst emotional cruelty and punishment that anyone could ever suffer. How many children do you have? We have 11 children. And Susanna wasn't the only Zumpe who ran away. Of the 11 Zumpe children, only six chose to be Bruderhof members when they reached adulthood. And the others chose a different way for the for now. Now, Susanna has a new family, ex-Bruderhof members. I'm very, very happy. I'm happy living here. As for Ben and Mariana, there has been no contact. I have called my parents several times this past year, and they refuse to talk to me. Now, what happened? Do you get them on the phone? Or? Well, I call, and then the, um, the secretary there says, well, hold on, I'll, I'll get them, and then they put you on hold for a real long time. And then they say, if you wish to contact your parents, um, write a letter. They don't want to talk to you. And if she phoned you today? I'll gladly take the phone call. Yes. Later in our 48 hours, yes. Susanna yes. tries to connect you with her no parents idea. once you more. At all. You don't know me at all. And you'll meet the Bruderhof's public enemy number one. What do you think the Bruderhof leadership thinks of you today? Oh, I think I'm the devil incarnate. He lost more than he ever thought possible. Stefan and Anna, this is the beginning of your wedding preparation. Now. Of all the traditions the Bruderhof holds sacred, none is stronger than the bond of marriage. We believe that a marriage has to last a whole life. Tonight, the commune is celebrating the upcoming wedding of two members with a ritual known as the love meal. Heavenly Father, we thank thee. That commitment to family is one of the things that attracted thank Sybil Sender to the Bruderhof 38 years ago. The proof is in the pudding. Our movement, 75 years, no divorces. No divorce? Well, not exactly. What do you think the Bruderhof leadership thinks of you today? Oh, I think I'm the devil incarnate. Remember Sybil's husband who dragged her into the Bruderhof? You're the devil. I'm the devil incarnate. Meet Ramon Sender, Sybil's ex-husband, the enemy. I'm the enemy. Not long after introducing Sybil to the life... I wrote her saying, would you meet me in New York? Ramon decided it wasn't for him and left. And then all I got was an engraved announcement of her becoming a member. And that's when he found himself cut off. From that point on, I was never allowed contact either with her or my daughter. Oh, here she is. This was in New York, my little baby. Because along with Sybil, Ramon also left behind his daughter, Zavari, then a toddler. How long had you been trying to see your daughter and, and well, had been rejected? 16 years. 
16 years of trying to get to yeah, see her yeah. and being turned away. Right. This is a picture I took of her in the diner. Father and daughter finally met when Zavari was 18. She was obviously so happy to see me, and we, we talked, but then suddenly her face would change, and I could see what was going through her mind, saying, oh, dear, I shouldn't be this excited because I have to remain faithful to the community and, and to my mother. But Sybil remembers the meeting quite differently. She said, Daddy, I don't want to do those things, thank you. I have a full life here of love and brotherhood and obedience to God. Ramon returned to San Francisco and tried to keep tabs on his daughter. I could see she was on the horns of a dilemma. To no avail. The Bruderhof has a way of behaving with ex-members. They don't let them have phone calls through to family. They don't answer their letters. They uh, don't allow visits. This is? Dory. You didn't know that she got married. I didn't you know. didn't know that she had two children. No. And then, in the end, you didn't know that she died. That's right. Until, until after she was a month gone. later. Yeah. Yeah. I got a letter from my son-in-law saying that Zavi had died of cancer. And of course, I, mean, I was floored. At first, I didn't believe it. I mean, I was climbing the walls. I mean, what can you imagine? This was the most horrible thing I could imagine because I'd always clung to the hope that somewhere down the line we would have this this great moment together where we would be in each other's arms and to give that that hope that I've been clinging to was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. When confronted with this, Sybil and the Bruderhof close ranks. Was that fair not to notify him when she became ill? Zavari, my daughter, did not once ask to see her father. Death in the community is a very special experience, and it would have been the last thing that Zavi would have wanted. There must be at least 500. Zavari's death galvanized Ramon to search for we other ex-members. I started one phone number, got two more, got four more, got six more. Within a month, I talked to 30 people. My mother passed away in, in the English Bruderhof. He found his situation was far from unique. Later. What's the biggest concern among all of the ex-members you're in contact with today? Visiting rights, access to their families. Can he see his grandchildren if he wants? Um, at, he, at the moment, the, the family feels it's not fitting for him to visit. Do you feel that way? Very much so, yes. Sometimes. Ramon put together a newsletter called Letters Keep in Touch, or KIT, and says he has hundreds of subscribers. What they've said publicly is that Ramon has declared that he is an enemy of the Bruderhof and sworn to destroy them. That, is their, that has been their official position. Professor Julius Rubin. The attitude they have, that there are sworn enemies on the outside that are actively seeking to destroy them. That's what upsets me. But commune leader Christoph Arnold denies that Ramon is the Bruderhof's public enemy number one. Actually, I thank God for Ramon because... First forecast to get the next day's weather in the top of our 11 o'clock news. Because we know the weather doesn't wait, so why should you wait for the weather? First forecast. This the Bruderhof must be watched. The vulnerability is there, and I do think that we would be wise as a society to learn from past mistakes. 30 years ago, Professor Benjamin Zablocki lived at the Bruderhof while doing research. He even published a book praising the commune. But today, he views the Bruderhof with caution. I think that uh, it would be a good idea to pay a little more attention to the group and to uh, subject them to a little bit more external surveillance. Christoph was upset when he heard Zablocki's words. Do you know when he was here? In the early 60s, that is what now, almost 40 years. And he, he hasn't been on the Buddha of except perhaps for a one hour visit. When you hear the word cult, what does that say It's a worn out phrase. Everything unusual now is a cult. I have a responsibility before God for everything which happens here. So, man alive. I don't want to have anything to do with a cult. I, I know we are accused as being one, but God knows. God knows. If you're a true believer like Sybil Sender, following God is what my life is about. You give your life to the Bruderhof. So let's tuck in. 
Meanwhile, Ramon Sendeir's grandchildren continue to live in the Bruderhof with Ramon's son-in-law, John Rose, the CEO of the Bruderhof businesses. You'd like to have a relationship with your grandchildren? Well, of course. Are you kidding? Look at these kids. They're adorable. Little Dory. <laughs> oh, well, here she is with her little daughter. That's your that's, that, that's my granddaughter. Rhodes told us he will not allow Ramon to see his grandchildren. Pretty baby. Yeah, very, very cute. And Susanna Zumpe, she did finally connect with her parents. The conversation did not begin happily. Well, I'm sure it hurts, Dad, but... You don't want to be with me anywhere. You don't want to be seen with me in public. You don't want to take my calls. You don't want to answer my letters. Of course it's not easy to listen to me, because you feel extremely guilty for cutting me off. You gave me up when I was born. You handed me over to the church to raise. It's all conditions with you people. I'll love you if. I'll be your parent if. What about unconditional love? Every day we start the day praying for her. Of course it hurts. What do you imagine will happen to her? I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. We, we wish her the best. And back at the commune, there is more work to be done, more babies to welcome, more life to be lived in a place Sybil Sinder still thinks of as paradise on earth. We don't expect to be loved by everybody. We know our life is controversial. 